You show us your love, O oh Lord, as you mold us with your hands. And as we stand before you, we ask for your holiness. Not because of what we've done, but all because of you. May our lives be a reflection of your holiness. May others see you, O oh Lord, when they look inside our eyes. Help us, O oh Lord, to strive every day for your holiness. Not because of what we've done, O oh Lord, but all because of you. May our lives be a reflection of your holiness. And may others see you, O oh Lord, when they look inside our eyes. Help us, O oh Lord, to strive every day. For your holiness, for your holiness, your Our common admonition for the next several weeks will be, set your mind on things above. We are seeking a spiritual reset. We look to realign our thoughts, our subsequent intentions, and our resulting actions toward glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our spiritual hearts must beat in syncopation with his ways and his means. We ought to desire what Jesus desires. We need to set our minds on things above. Recall our verse from Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Last Sunday, I showed you from Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 5 from his Sermon on the Mount, and also instruction from the Pharisee-trained Apostle Paul, how human efforts to keep commandments and traditions are fruitless. Our own efforts are incapable of beginning a relationship with God. We depend totally upon Him to save us and to keep us by His grace and His grace alone. And in the same fashion, our own efforts cannot continue or maintain that relationship with Him. Once again, in our Christian walk, we are totally dependent upon the Lord to lead us, to guide us, to teach and instruct us, to hold us and keep us, to strengthen us. It all rests with Him. Consider this thought for a moment. Proverbs 16:9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. How many times have I said, well, tomorrow I'm going to mow the lawn, or get the oil changed, or take a trip, or whatever plans I might be making. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. See, the Lord may have other plans for me tomorrow. I might end up going in a different direction than what I'd planned. The Lord directs each step. He is in the details. James cautions us in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, 
we shall live and do this or that. We should think if the Lord wills. See, there needs to be a change in our thought process. We need to think and to plan, all the while being aware that God is there. Since we belong to Him through His Son, our God has a claim on us. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20 say, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So, we are not our own. We have been bought with the blood of Jesus. Hence, we are to glorify God in our bodies. To glorify the Lord, we must realize that we must wholly and completely depend upon Him to do that in and through us. As we said last week, this is not a matter of striving to keep a checklist of rules and commandments, you know, like, oh, let's see. Uh, yes, I did that. Check. Um, also did that. Check. And uh, let's see. Also did that. Check. Okay. Only one more thing to do. And I can say that I have lived today for the Lord. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's not like that. Thank goodness it's not like that. Recall what I said last week. Living for the Lord is much more about being than it is about doing. And I base that on Proverbs 23, verse 7, which says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's a state of being. To glorify God in my body, meaning the things that I do, I must be thinking rightly in my heart, which makes me what I am. If I am not thinking rightly in my heart, I will still do things in my body. But those things will not glorify God. Only what I allow Him to do through me will bring Him glory. Hey, in case you hadn't noticed, Christian friend, it is still possible for a believer to sin. And the problem lies inside the, the heart. Okay, and the solution also lies inside the heart. Okay, a, a born again believer possesses two natures, one old and the other new. Our main verse about setting our minds on things above comes from Colossians chapter 3. And a little further along in that Colossians 3 passage, we read this. Colossians 3, 9 and 10 says, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Notice Paul doesn't say, since you've put off the old man, it is therefore impossible for you to lie to one another. No, not at all. It is still possible for a Christian to tell a lie, even many lies. What we see here is that because we have a new man or a new nature as a Christian, it is now possible for us to be truthful. Often, in fact, we can get to the point where we are known for our honesty, our integrity, our trustworthiness. When we come to faith in Christ, when we are saved, a new nature comes to life within us, a spiritual nature. But that old nature doesn't go away. And it won't until we are called from the things of this old earth and we pass on to the new and better things above. This old nature was passed down from our founding father, Adam. We see that Adam's son, Seth, inherited his father's likeness. Genesis 5.3 says, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. That likeness we have inherited, and it includes the sin nature. So as believers, while we are living here, we will have these two natures, the old and the new, and there will be a constant struggle. Remember what we heard from the Apostle Paul in last week's sermon, Romans seven fourteen and 15. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. 
Note that Paul refers to the law as spiritual. I had said last week that when Jesus expounded on the law in his Sermon on the Mount, he demonstrated that the law is a direct expression of the righteous and holy nature and character of God himself. In the law, as Jesus expressed it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, our Creator God is saying, This is the kind of person I am at heart. And that's why Paul says here in Romans 7 that the law is spiritual. It reflects the nature of God who gave us the law. Now, when we as believers were saved, we received spiritual life from God. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says that God made us alive, for we were spiritually dead in sin. But notice that Paul says here in Romans 7 that he is carnal. That means fleshly. That means living according to the flesh, or in other words, living according to that old nature that still exists within a Christian's being. So Paul is here describing this struggle that we all experience as believers, that internal fight between our old man and new man, our carnal and spiritual natures, battling it out. So then what do we do about this struggle? How do we handle it? Well, maybe we ourselves don't really do anything. A very good illustration comes from a story about an elderly man who was being honored by his church for many years of, of being a saintly example to the rest of the congregation, especially to the young people. And so he, they had him come up front and he sat in a special chair next to the pulpit one Sunday morning. And the pastor who was interviewing him asked him, Gilbert, we all know what it's like as believers to have to struggle with sin. It's a real challenge. Now, you don't seem to really have that problem, brother. How have you conquered it in your life? And the old saint laughed, and then he replied, Well, pastor, I still sense that battle in my heart. It's still a struggle. But I learned a while back that I have two dogs who live inside me. One is an old junkyard dog who scraps with everyone, snaps at everyone, tries to bite them, and is just generally an out-of-control, untamable mess. The other dog is a friendly, obedient, faithful companion to his master, gently heeding everything the master says and constantly watching him, looking to see what the master's next move might be so he can respond in kind. Now, both those dogs are always fighting each other, each one trying to be the alpha, trying to be the top dog. The pastor followed up. So, Gilbert, which dog wins the fight? And Gilbert said, well, the one that I feed the most. So, Christian, which dog are you feeding? I really like that illustration. And I also have a short little poem that reminds me of the dog story. It kind of sums it up. So I memorize the poem. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one I love, the one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. If the dog story and the poem speak the truth, just feed the new nature and it will take care of the rest. But does the Bible back that up? Stories and poems are great, even helpful, but we need to rest upon the authority of God's Word. Romans 13, 14 is a good starting point, very foundational to the key thought of the story in the poem. It says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Don't make provision for the flesh. Don't feed that junkyard dog. Don't supply the old nature with those things that are going to cater to what it desires. There's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has provided. But if we are in a habit of overdoing something, breaking the barriers of doing things in moderation, we risk catering to the flesh. Now this will require some self-examination. Scope out your environment, your home, 
your car, your place of work, your, your locker at school, where, wherever you might be spending time. Is there anything that you are doing or anything you're per permitting, anything you have around you in, in your environment that, that feeds this old nature? I recall reading some years ago uh, an account of, a, of an emergency room nurse who took, upon, took it upon herself to try and lose some weight. And, and one day while at work, it, it suddenly dawned on her that she had almost unconsciously over time scheduled her basic workday in, in such a manner that it allowed her to make regular stops at the candy machine. It wasn't just about really liking sweets either. She, she discovered that she had surrendered control of her life to seek comfort and consolation, to try and satisfy some inner desire at the candy machine. The candy machine was the central hub of her entire day. And her well-being and her health was paying the price for it. So now let's go back to that junkyard dog for a moment. Think about the things you know that are basic nature to all dogs, whether junkyard dogs or the, the friendly companion type. Especially those things they do whenever they want something from you. And that usually involves treats and snacks. Every dog I've ever had will sit and will stare at me. Not even blinking, right? to watch and study my every move. I mean, is it possible that I might get up and, and get the dog a treat? Watching, staring, not letting me out of its sight, and just so still, on point, right? If I start moving in, in any direction or in any manner, well, then suddenly there can be a little happy dance, a, a tail can start to wag, there may even be a whimper or a whine. <laughs> oh, he's getting up, he's moving. Hey, I'm here, I have needs. Those behaviors can at times be annoying, but they also are what make our dogs so endearing to us. Okay, now transfer that same kind of behavior pattern that we just talked about to that old nature inside of you because I think it's the same. Lose the endearing part, all right? Your sin nature and mine is constantly on point, constantly waiting for the opportunity to indulge in whatever you might be craving or desiring. It stares at you, it nags at you, nudges you, bugs you, waiting for you to move toward whatever snack that it wants. And it won't be placated or satisfied or quieted down until you give in. And the satisfaction is of course only temporary every single time. Now this isn't necessarily a sermon about alcohol, but there is an analogy for all sinful behavior to be found in Proverbs 23, verses 29 and 30, and verse 35 says this, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. And verse 35, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? No satisfaction. The drunkard wakes up again and is seeking yet another drink. And this behavior is not limited to alcohol. It's the same for all of our sinful habits. I hate what it's doing to me, but I'm going to seek it again the first chance that I get. I need to clarify. Though I've used a candy machine, dog treats, and wine as analogies and examples, what I'm saying is not just limited to the abuse of material substances like alcohol, drugs, or food. No, this is the same pattern. It's the same case for any sinful behavior. Shouting in anger at somebody and then excusing yourself because, well, I just had to get that off my chest. You know, 
lying to someone to cover for yourself. Being so self-focused and concerned about being treated fairly yourself that you totally ignore the plight of injustice that others around you might be experiencing. And pursuing your own dreams and desires without even considering what the Lord might desire for you. And on and on and on. And all of it is internally motivated. As Jesus describes in his Sermon on the Mount, which we read from last week, all sinful behavior begins in the heart, lusting in the heart, hating others in your heart, and so forth. And here's the rub. You will never, ever be able to satisfy that longing through earthly pursuits for temporal things. Ecclesiastes 2.11 says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Ravi Zacharias, the Christian apologist, who had the popular radio program Let My People Think, passed away this week from cancer at the age of 74. His teaching was very influential in my adult life. Ravi told the story of Dion Sanders, one of the greatest athletes ever, the only one to ever have competed in both NFL and MLB championships. Ravi shared how after Sanders' Super Bowl victory, he ordered his dream car, one he had always wanted, his Lamborghini. He sat in his hotel room that night, and in the quiet it dawned on him that even though he'd achieved everything he'd ever wanted, he was now astonishingly feeling so empty inside. On that night, Dion Sanders gave his life to Christ. Ravi then commented, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has just let you down. Can you see more clearly now how pointless it is to keep on feeding your old nature? The Apostle Paul said, Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its deep desires. In contrast, he juxtaposed that sentence with another one preceding it, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. To close out this morning, let's consider what he said there. What does it mean to put on Jesus? The first obvious thought is that this is meant to focus on that new nature that the believer has. So how does the believer who has received Christ as Savior now put him on? The Greek verb used does literally mean putting clothes on someone. Here Paul is using it in a figurative sense to put on Christ so that you might exhibit his characteristics. Just as a suit of clothing can change one's appearance, so putting on Christ can change your appearance, your conduct before others. Paul uses this verb to put on in Ephesians 4, verses 20 and 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Here Paul tells us to change clothes, take off the old man, which means the same as we talked about earlier. Don't feed that old nature. Don't make provision for it to fulfill its desires. And put on the new man, the new nature, which was created in accordance with God's nature. The new nature is truly righteous and holy. It cannot sin. How much better then to give the new nature free reign in our lives? Note as well how this happens internally, 
we are renewed in the spirit of our minds from what we have heard from Christ and what we have been taught by him. Dwelling on his word in the inner life, then, effects this change of clothes, so to speak, upon our outward life. Our key thought in this series is set your mind on things above, which comes from Colossians 3, 2. We've also already looked at Colossians 3, 9, and 10 today. Here it is once again. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Paul uses similar language here to what he said in Ephesians 4. We're to put off the old man and put on the new man. Once again, we see the emphasis on the new man being fed and renewed on the inside with increasing knowledge that is related to the image or the nature of God who created the new man. Paul elaborates on this change of clothes in verses 12 and 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Only believers have the new nature. We see that in this passage. Paul speaks to the elect of God, holy and beloved, language that can only be applied to redeemed people. Here we get more of a description of the characteristics which make up putting on Christ. Notice how sharply these contrast with the old self-centered nature. And all of this having to do with how we relate to others. We are to be tender toward the other person, identifying with how they might be feeling. And then we should exercise mercy toward them, withholding any judgment, any condemnation. We need to feel akin toward them. That's what kindness means, to treat them how we would like to be treated in kind. Humility compels us to keep our selfish side out of the interactions we have with other people. Meekness speaks of a controlled strength, a sort of holding back, prepared to help the other person without being overbearing and feeling like I'm the guy who has all the answers, right? We should suffer long with them, bearing with them, forgiving them, and all of this is bound up together perfectly in love, which means to desire the best for the other person and to know what that best is through knowledge of the Word of God and to do what we can to make the best a reality for that other person. See, this is what it would look like to allow that new nature to rule in our hearts what it would look like to put on Christ. Throughout the morning, we've noted that these changes happen to us, not by our own efforts to try and make it so, for we cannot do that. Rather, the change begins internally through knowing Christ better through his word and allowing the resulting change to fill our hearts and to remake us to be more like him. There's a whole lot more to this idea of setting our minds on things above. There's more to understand to reset our focus. And so next Sunday, we'll learn how the Bible itself can help us become more like the image of Jesus. Just remember for the week in between now and then, Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one I love, the one I hate. The one I feed will dominate.
Yes.